Well, today, on this first Sunday after Easter, it's a great time to look at what the Bible says concerning the question, after Easter, now what? After Easter, now what? And I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Uh, normally, I try to go through this passage of Scripture in two different Bible studies. Today, we're going to be going through in one Bible study, hopefully, and be able to get through at least several of the large rocks of truth and application that God would have us to understand and take away from our study today. Now, it is after Easter Sunday as well for the disciples. And uh, in John chapter 21, uh, as we see the disciples uh, doing in the first verse or two exactly what God had asked them to do in Matthew chapter 28. In fact, an angel told the women to tell the disciples this, and Jesus told them this in person, uh, I believe it was verse 7, Matthew chapter 28, when he said, go to Galilee and go to a mountain in Galilee, and I'll meet you there. Man, talk about a mountaintop experience. Uh, they're going to Galilee to meet with the risen Christ himself. And so I imagine uh, they were um, awful excited when they left Jerusalem and made their way to Galilee. Now, we don't know what mountain they were on. Uh, I, I think perhaps as good as any guess might be, they were at the Mount of Olives. Uh, one thing's for sure, because the Sea of Galilee is a large, deep lake surrounded by mountains and hills, wherever they were, they probably had a pretty good view of the Sea of Galilee. And so there they are waiting for Jesus, doing just as Jesus said to do. They were right where God wanted them to be, but no Jesus. Have you ever been right where you thought God wanted you to be, but you sense that he wasn't really there with you in the way that you expected him to be? Well, Peter finally said, I'm going fishing. And it looks like Peter was pretty much the leader of the band still because it ended up with eight of them going fishing together in the Sea of Galilee. And so they go fishing, and the thing that we see to begin with is, number one, an unexpected encounter. They go fishing, and they experience something they did not expect. Notice the decision of the disciples. In verse 3, the Bible says, and Peter's talking, he says, I'm going fishing. Uh, and then they said, hey, we're coming with you. Uh, and they told him, and they went out, and they got into the boat. We're not sure whose boat it was. Um, might have been Peter's boat. You know, he was a fisherman. It might have been another boat belonging to the disciples or a friend. But anyway, they all decided to go with him, or at least seven more of them did. Now, here we see the influence of leadership. As John Maxwell has said, leadership is when uh, someone follows you. And if you say you're a leader and nobody's following you, then you're just taking a walk. Well, Peter wasn't taking a walk. He was leading others to go with him. Now, here's the question. Why do you suppose they went fishing? Well, uh, it might be that uh, they were waiting and Jesus hadn't come yet. And so they decided, hey, we need, we need to pay our taxes and so we better go earn some money and go fishing. Uh, or maybe they said, you know, we have families to feed, and it's been a while since we've been able to be with them since the crucifixion, so let's go ahead and, uh, and see if we can catch some fish so that we can feed our families or maybe feed ourselves. You know, a good fresh fish dinner sounds pretty good. Uh, or maybe they were thinking, hey, now that Jesus has risen from the dead, we just thought the ministry was growing before. It's going to really take off. We better fund this ministry of our Lord's that we're a part of. So let's go earn some money by going fishing. Or maybe it was something as simple as he was sitting there, Peter was looking at that lake, Jesus had not shown up, and he thought, you know, if we're going to wait for Jesus, let's wait for him in the boats and let's go fishing. Uh, it's been a while since we fished. Uh, it might be a good stress reliever. It might be a good time together. Or, or I just want to go fishing. And so they went together with him. Now, Here's something I want us to see in the text. Were they, did they stop waiting on Jesus when they went fishing? No. They were still waiting on Jesus. Jesus didn't say, I'll meet you on a mountain, but until then, don't do anything else until I get there. You see, they were waiting actively. Now, sometimes waiting on the Lord is a hard thing to do. Uh, it, it's, it's something that 
at times young Christians don't understand. It's not a matter of taking a, a yoga posture and humming to yourself until God just miraculously appears. We are to wait faithfully by putting faith into practice. We're to wait obediently by doing what Jesus told us to do. We're to wait prayerfully by seeking Him in prayer. We're to wait devotionally by seeking and listening to Him speak to us in His Word. We're to wait uh, uh, in ministry and service to others. We're to wait as a witness to a lost and dying world that desperately needs to hear the gospel. We are to actively wait for Jesus to come. They have a decision to make. Peter says, I'm going fishing. They go with him. Then you see the distraction of favorite things. In, in chapter 21, verse 3, the last part, it says, they went out and got in a boat, uh, and that night they ended up catching wah, wah, nothing. Have you ever gone fishing like that before? And you thought you were going to catch something, but unfortunately you didn't? You know, um, now, there they go out there fishing, and nothing happens. You might say, perhaps, that they were somewhat distracted while they were fishing and nothing happening, getting, getting frustrated all over again. Maybe not as relaxing as what Peter had envisioned that fishing trip being. You know, it's too easy today for us to be distracted by too many things. Never in the history, the annals of humankind history, has a nation of people had citizens that had as many luxuries and as many comforts and as many conveniences, as many pleasures, as many things to pursue and practice that are temporary, that are appealing to the flesh, but deny our spirit of the things things that truly would make us rich in our faith. Are you trading away that which you'll never lose uh, for the things that you cannot hope to hold on to? Are you so committed to improving yourself uh, in your flesh that without realizing it, you are impoverishing yourself in the things of the Spirit? My pastor Jim Plites used to remind us saying, come what may, this life is always worth living with the Lord Jesus. And then he would say, be careful that you don't allow the good things to replace the best things that God has for you. Because if the good replaces the best, then the good will in time turn out to be bad because you have missed out on what God wanted for you most of all. Now, I'm not trying to please lay a guilt trip on anyone, and I certainly stand at the front of the line when it comes to too often settling for things that, that deny me of the better things that God has for me to experience and know. I'm very thankful that all of us are here today, but how successful would some of us be in our jobs, in our finances, what about in our hobbies that we like to pursue and practice? If we gave to these things, the, listen, the same amount of time, attention, uh, and focus that we give to our Christian lives. Interesting question. Could it be then that God has for us this Sunday after Easter, take away with us the power and the promise and the practice of the resurrection by living our lives at a higher level when it comes to our spiritual walk of faith. Because if you're really a follower of Jesus Christ, it's Easter every day. Amen? It's resurrection all the time. Well, then we have the discernment of the Savior. Look down at verse 4. The Bible says, Daybreak came. And Jesus stood on the shore. However, look at this, the disciples didn't know it was him. Okay, sun comes up, and uh, they fished all night. Not a single fish. Not a single solitary small little fish. Empty. And then they see this man standing on the shore, but they don't know it's Jesus. What is Jesus doing? He's watching them. Watching them become more and more frustrated at their failures. He's listening to them. Have you ever stood on the shore early morning hours on a lake or a pond or a bayou? 
Have you ever been out fishing early in the morning and another boat is, is quite a long ways away and they're talking and the sound of just normal conversation carries across the water? Jesus was hearing what they were saying. Jesus was seeing what they were fail, how they were failing. And moreover than that, Jesus knew what they were thinking because he knows what's in our hearts. Now, unknown to them, the risen Jesus is the one who is standing at the shore. And what does he see? He sees them failing. Now, he has intentionally delayed his appearing to them. Uh, they did exactly what he told them to do. But did he, uh, was he there on the mountaintop waiting for them when they got there? No, they had waited for him for some time and hadn't seen him, so they went fishing. Can you think another time when Jesus delayed coming or going somewhere? Remember Lazarus when they got the word that, that Lazarus, his friend, was, was sick unto death? Come quickly and, and heal him. And he waited. And then they said, we better go. And, and he said, well, Lazarus is asleep. It's time to go. And they thought he was resting. No, he was dead. Had been dead several days. And Jesus said the reason why he went there was to show and reveal the power and the glory of God in raising a dead man back to life. It was for purpose. And so it was for purpose that Jesus delayed in meeting the disciples there in the Sea of Galilee on the mountain. Now, now why is that? I think he knew they weren't going to have a very successful night of fishing. He knew that they were failing at what they should have been best at.